This is the Decoding Obesity Podcast, where we simplify, demystify, and decode obesity, helping you lose weight and feel great. So gear up for a fascinating journey through this ever-evolving field, and let's see what we find. And please remember that the thoughts and opinions on this podcast do not constitute medical advice. Don't forget to visit our website, www.decodingobesity.com, for show notes and more info. And now, here's your host of the Decoding Obesity Podcast, Dr. Avishkar Sabarwal. Hi friend, welcome back to Decoding Obesity. Humans come in all shapes and sizes. For some reason, our society looks down on people in larger sizes. I had Amelia Sherry on my show some time back and we talked about disordered eating and how to prevent uh, children from developing that. Well, since I am talking about childhood obesity this month, we thought it might be good to talk about how to raise a child in a larger body. Now, for those of you who do not know, Amelia Sherry is a registered and certified dietitian nutritionist who works primarily with children and parents who are struggling with issues related to weight, growth, diabetes, and parent-child feeding dynamics. She's based in New York and has a private practice. She is also founder of Nourish Her, an online resource where she offers community education and support to mothers who are recovering from a history of chronic dieting and disordered eating so that they can raise their children to have happy, healthy relationships with food. Welcome back, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me again. I enjoyed our last talk so much. Yeah, it was so much fun. I mean, I really appreciate it. You know, it, it puts a different perspective on, you know, how things are and how we th- perceive them to be. And that's kind of the reason why I thought and we had discussed this, you know, doing an episode on how to raise children in a larger body, because it's not like one size fits all, right? Everybody has a different body makeup. And the society, unfortunately, puts a norm on that what is normal and what is not. And I thought this would be very important to talk about so that we can understand how to tackle these issues, especially, you know, if parents who are listening to this episode or this podcast who have children who are, you know, in a larger body. So let's talk about it. I think it would be prudent to start, you know, thinking about it from the perspective of kids. What do you think are the challenges faced by kids, you know, especially in a larger body, both physical and mental? Yeah, that's a great question. I think kids feel, well, we know from research that children as young as three feel concerned or worried about the size and shape of their body, particularly kids in larger bodies. And we have research on weight stigma, which I know you've talked about in earlier episodes and weight bias. So kids do feel this and their parents feel it as well. They feel concerned about how their child is going to be perceived by other people in this body and assumptions that I think others will make about their health or their well-being or their habits. We know that when you are living in a larger body because of weight stigma, you're more likely to feel more socially isolated or isolate yourself. Um, you're more likely to avoid health care. And personally, as a provider, I know that many parents, when they are referred to someone, to a nutritionist for weight management or weight counseling, that right there can be a negative experience because it's suddenly assumed that there's something wrong with your eating, right? And I've had many parents skip visits with me, avoid visits with me. And when I've talked to them about it, it is the fear that I'm going to judge them, right? And it's, they think that I'm going to walk into it judging them because of the size of their child's body and that I might blame them um, or look at them if they're in a larger body and make judgments. That's absolutely not the case for me personally, but I do not blame parents. I completely understand where that fear is coming from. And again, we know from research that literally people will avoid healthcare because of this fear of judgment. And because of that, there are reduced quality of life for people who are living in larger bodies because of that stigma. They might have less likely to be active and not because their body is not capable of moving in a positive way beautiful way, but because they feel judged by moving around in front of other people because of their body. So living in a larger body can be very challenging because of those ideas that are out there in popular culture that make assumptions about or believe that there's something wrong with a larger body and that a smaller body is somehow better, healthier which is actually in contradiction to what was thought, you know, many decades ago or centuries ago. And I'm not a historian, but you can read plenty of books and understand how the idealized body has changed over time. And I think that's very interesting to look at. 
when you're trying to challenge your own ideas, you know? Yeah, I think that's very important to understand. And uh, listeners, if you haven't checked out episode 66, that was a whole episode uh, dedicated to weight bias in our society and how that impacts us as individuals. So please do listen to that episode to know more about, you know, the weight stigma and the weight bias. But, you know, I think, uh, uh, Amelia, what uh, parents do is with the best of intentions, right? Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you work on the, you know, the parent-child feeding dynamics. What is the parent's perspective when you see parents, uh, you know, bringing their children to you who are in a larger body? What are they going through mentally? Well, there's two groups of parents, I'd say. There's a parent who's also living in a larger body, which is very common, and they may have felt this negative impact of the weight stigma and the weight bias on them throughout their lives. They may very be very fearful for their child. So they may not, um, they may want to do whatever they can to protect their child in one way that they might approach it is by trying to help their child be in a smaller body. And of course, we often are thought that the way to do that is by changing their diet and having them be more active. When that pressure is coming from a place of wanting to change body size, it's definitely negatively felt by the child. So now they're getting it from society, friends, culture, and then they're also getting it from their parents, which again, there comes from the best of intention from the parent. The parent may know that that is wrong to try to want their child to be in anybody but the one that they're naturally in. But they may also consciously or subconsciously feel that fear and that have ha- even had that negative experience themselves because of their body. So that's one group of parents that I've had come to me. There's another group of parents that come to me and they may not recognize that there's anything wrong or incorrect about their child's larger body, but a medical provider might bring it up to them in a visit. They might, a pediatricians are taught to flag certain BMIs as, you know, this peti- particular patient because of their BMI needs to be screened for these other disease risks. Then that parent may have had a conversation with the pediatrician that we're screening and testing for these risk factors based on your bodies. And that can be a like a trigger for a lot of fear in the parent all of a sudden. Now they're looking at their child and identifying their child's larger body as a potential risk factor for disease, which again, we need to look at weight signs. That may or may not be true. It's certainly not just based on their BMI. It is based on their habits, not the size of their body. But that is not always made clear to parents. So they may have a lot of fear in them about, oh my gosh, my child's body size is a problem because it may lead to health consequences. And that can put, as we talked about in um, the earlier episode, when you have these ideas in your mind and you come to the table and try to enjoy a meal, it can really cause a lot of negative pressure and, and really impact a child's eating in a negative way, which their child's eating may or may not have likely not have been a problem to begin with. Right. So, Amelia, in the long run, how does this impact the children who are going through all of this? Well, I feel very strongly about this issue. So one thing that I think really tears at my heartstrings is the idea that they children feel not accepted by their parents. So they feel all of a sudden that their weight is a problem and that the body they're in is a problem and that their parent can't accept them the way they are, that is heartbreaking to me. Now, I know from the parent side, it comes from, again, this place of, well, I want to protect you from possible health risks and possible being stigmatized again because of the body that you're in. But the idea that I'm not perfect the way I am is very, I think that can be very devastating to a child. So I teach a lot of acceptance to parents. And a lot of that is focusing on, you know, the larger body is not a bad body. It's not a wrong body. And let's focus on all the things. We can't control the size and shape of our body. Let's focus on the things that we can control, our habits, our attitudes towards food, our access to being active and our attitudes towards that. It's not punishment. It's positive. It's therapeutic. It feels great. Those types of working on that sort of approach with parents, I think, is a lot more helpful. Yeah, I think that makes sense because, you know, there are certain things that you can control and certain things you certainly cannot control. And fretting over things that you cannot control is almost always going to be futile. The faster we can get to a place with the parent, which cannot, the parent can also be processing their negative emotions about these things. Um, but the faster we can get to a place of let's help your child accept and appreciate the body they're in 
and not waste time trying to change it, which as we've talked about, you know, dieting, it can be very futile, you know, over time. We probably aren't going to have success in pushing down that BMI and and we're definitely going to probably cause some negative consequences. So let's get to the point where we help your child accept the body that they're in and again, appreciate it for all the things that it can do and is doing for them and then move move into the habits, you know, instead of wasting time there, just trying to change what we can. And also, like I said, trying to change a child's body, I think really has consequences on that idea of acceptance from the parent and their interpersonal relationships, right? That's not a message you really want to get from the people in your life who are there to support you, especially when the culture out there, as we talked about, is going to be such a negative, unfortunately, potentially negative influence on your feelings about yourself. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, parents are the supporting pillars, right? Especially for the younger age groups. So I think that's very important to understand. I think what would be helpful for our listeners, Amelia, would be if you could share certain examples or some examples from your practice, just so that we understand kind of what happens and how the dynamics change. I think it might be helpful. Do you have any any clients that you worked with that have had success with this? Sure, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, so say for example, a parent goes into a pediatrician's office and gets this news that their child's BMI either has been tracking very high above a certain percentile or now has changed to a certain percentile, and the parent has a feeling of fear or concern about their child's weight, which extrapolates into their eating and their activity. Then what we find when they come to the table, they may either be overtly or subtly trying to restrict how much the child's eating, right? So often parents will say things like, come on, you know, we have to be healthy. This is a healthy food to eat. Please eat more vegetables. Please don't, let's not eat so much sugar or dessert, or they'll start cutting out those elements. Sometimes parents again, with the best of intentions, will start restricting just the one child in the family and really pulling out one child if there are multiple children in the family and telling that child or having different rules for that child with regard to food is, I don't recommend doing that at all. You know, it's, if you are going to make changes, we always recommend doing it family-wide. I also never recommend doing it because of weight. It can be for other reasons, like we need, we want to be more balanced or have more energy, or let's just try to learn to enjoy some new foods, things like that. But many parents I work with that are faced with a child who is very underweight, and then a child who is in a larger body. And then that becomes very complicated because they are pressuring or wanting to encourage one child to eat more and at the same time telling another child that they're having too much. And that has negative impacts on children, both of those children's ability to internally regulate their intake, meaning we've talked, I think, before about that body wisdom and body trust and really listening to how much and how little we need from the inside as opposed to using portion control and outside rules, which can be very fear-based and really have the opposite effect. You know, we know from research that when we restrict foods, especially in parents who restrict children, those children tend to overeat or eat in a more out of control way when they're not with their parent. And we don't want that. We want kids to be feel very calm and confident when they eat and eat in tune with their body. And it's very interesting because a lot of the same phenomenon happen with the very underweight kids and the kids in larger body from my experience with it, it's like two sides of the same coin, right? Like yeah. parents pressure the smaller child to eat more because they're concerned. And again, that concern might be coming in through a pediatrician as well, who's saying, oh, well, your child's really low on the BMI percentile. Let's fatten them up. Let's get them bigger, you know? And then the parent comes to the table with this sort of agenda of, oh, you need to eat some more. I'm really worried about you. You might not be growing. We know from research that pressuring leads to lower intake of the very same foods that are often identified as being healthy, like fish and, you know, red meats and vegetables. A child typically gets pressure to eat those foods and will um, eat less of them over time, even into adulthood. Yeah, I think you raise a very valid point. You know, a lot of times physicians will raise these concerns and sometimes rightly so, you know, but it's always a trend I, as far as I know in, you know, in pediatrics, we don't look at for anything in medicine for that matter. It's a trend of what we see, whether, you know, the BMI is persistently staying low persist- or going high. I think from my perspective, taking that and understanding what is the underlying cause of this is more important. Say, for example, somebody is in a smaller body, but genetically their parents were lean to begin with. That's a very different picture than somebody who is 
you know, in that body and has something else going on, right? So it's very important to understand rather than just focusing on the meals and making sure that the kid is eating more or being forced to eat more in that case and you know vice versa for a kid who's in a larger body it's kind of trying to understand what's really going on over here what's the underlying issue and kind of you know it's kind of like peeling the onion and understanding what underneath layers and uh, tackling those issues because those are going to be kind of the real real issues that need to be dealt with right Yes, absolutely. And if you're working with a pediatric nutritionist who can help you look at the growth, the chart and the curves in a more nuanced way, that is very helpful because a child who is in a larger body and has been at, say, a higher percentile for height and weight and BMI since the time they were very young and has tracked beautifully along that curve, but say, hey, they're at the 98th percentile, that to me is a child that does not need intervention with their eating. You know, they're growing in that very predictable way and they're maintaining their curve. The time and same for a child in a smaller body, like you said, if they're genetically predisposed to being in a very thin, lean body and we see two parents who also are in that same body type and they're tracking low, maybe even below the fifth percentile. I've had kids who aren't even on, you know, they're zero point something percentile. But if they've maintained that and they're developing and following that curve normally, there's no reason to intervene with their food. Yes, I can do an assessment of their intake and identify if there's one particular, you know, maybe iron or calcium. Some Those are things we look at often. But we can also look at the larger picture. I've had kids that are tracking low like that and they're thriving in school. They're thriving with their relationships. So to, again, look at their body type and shape and say, well, it's not close enough to average, meaning it's wrong. And I'm using air quotes, is a, a disservice to the child and can put end up having a lot of implications on their relationship with food because now everything becomes about how much they're eating and whether they're a good eater whether they're doing it right. And that is when we start to see disorder, not necessarily an eating disorder, but disordered behaviors around food. And again, a child who's been tracking at a higher BMI percentile and suddenly drops or shoots up even higher, those are times when we want to get really curious and say, hmm, what's going on here? From my perspective, it often is linked with intervention then from the outside where someone has identified, oh, your larger body is an issue. And we come in with a lot of more rules and let's control eating more. And that, unfortunately, what I usually see is that the BMI will shoot up even higher. It's because it can be a little complicated. It depends on on each family what's going on and how the child perceives their own weight and how it may or may not relate to their actual eating. But changes do... I think the main point is to recognize that when the BMI percentile changes dramatically or significantly, that's when we want to really look at the eating, not necessarily because it is high or because it is very low, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think it makes sense. And I just want to uh, want to point out to my listeners that just do not take the BMI percentile one point in time. And I would say just look at the trend. And in the same breath, I would say that, you know, pediatricians do a good job of trending the BMIs. So listen to your pediatrician, definitely. And if they do recommend, you know, talking to a nutritionist or a dietitian, please do so because that helps kind of understand the eating habits of the child. And if there is something that needs help with, they may or may not need help with eating per se or eating the right things or, you know, whatever, changing the diet. But just focusing on the BMI at one point in time may not be the right approach. And the other thing to to understand is, you know, especially younger kids, as they grow up, they sometimes do outgrow that larger body, especially when they when they reach the adolescent age. And again, pediatricians are very well versed in all of this. So please do listen to your pediatrician. We're not trying to say that what pediatricians are saying is wrong. I think when they raise a concern, it's very valid. And you should certainly seek help from a, a dietitian if they do refer you to somebody, but try and understand what's going on because it's a team effort. And the team definitely involves the pediatrician your child, you as a parent, and you know if they involve a dietitian as well. So what do you have to say about that, Amelia? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Your pediatricians are your, you know, your main resource and it's important to let them help you understand the growth curve. I would warn against taking a number or hearing one BMI percentile and Googling it and then deciding that your child's in a larger body or a higher unsafe or unhealthy BMI and making changes 
there. I think since we're talking about how to support kids in larger bodies, I think the important thing is to understand that if you are raising a child in a larger body, I think the most important thing you can do is to help them accept their body and appreciate their body for what it is. Focus on all of the beautiful, healthy habits that they have, you know, being active or if they eat a variety of foods or the fact that they're even making eating a priority and coming to the table and sitting with you and enjoying food. Focusing on those things is the best way to support your child as opposed to leaning into more control around eating, which I think really, again, just communicates that you don't accept the body that they're in and they need that they need to change, whether it be to be healthy or to be confident that I think we know, again, from research that interfering in that way by applying diets and restriction has negative consequences. So a child in a larger body needs your accept acceptance and support and encouragement with their eating as opposed to more control over their eating, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I'm going to ask you two questions before we end today. What can parents do differently, number one? And what can we do differently as a society? (laughs) Those are beautiful, beautiful, important questions. To be very honest, I think If a parent is raising a child in a larger body and is feeling stressed or triggered by this, that getting support from outside the family is very important. Getting support from a health at every size provider or a weight neutral provider, whether it be a a psychotherapist or a therapist, social worker, or a nutritionist is very important because We come, even as nutritionists, even as providers, we come with this bias. It is in us and we pick it up from society. So it can be very challenging to shift our thinking around it. And the last thing, again, that we want the child to do is feel that there's something wrong with them when when there isn't. It's more a cultural decision that there's something wrong with them. There isn't actually anything wrong with them. So if you need support, and I have struggled with this myself, it's a thing that I have found, you know, even cognitively knowing that there's nothing wrong with a larger body, there can be a, a deep impulse to think, oh, let me protect this child from this situation. So getting that very, you know, not beating yourself up about it to have these conflicting feelings inside and getting that support from the outside, I think is the best way to support your child because it is not easy and we are confronted with it constantly in culture. What can we do as a larger culture? We can challenge messages about weight, just like we are encouraging each other to challenge messages about race. And these bias that we have towards weight, we do not have to accept them, even though they're threaded through not just what you know we call diet culture and the dieting industry, but health culture as well, which teaches us that smaller bodies are healthier bodies. We need to challenge that idea over and over. And I think just looking at, you know, the people as opposed to what we see in media and culture, look at the people around us that we love and admire and respect. They come in all different kinds of bodies. That is the real world, you know, and it's not these ideas that we have in our head. So that's very challenging. But I think just the first step is just to challenge ideas about weight. And sometimes it is just something you're going to work on internally. And sometimes, you know, I have clients, families, and even colleagues who are a lot more verbal about being outspoken and challenging it in their day-to-day lives through conversations, um, through writing, and, you know, just do what you can. Just being aware, I think, is the very first step for people who are just starting to think about these these ideas. No, I I think that's very well said, that we do need to challenge these norms. You know, people do come in different sizes, as I say, but at some point in time, you know, there's definitely a health component to it. But let your physician, I would say let the the child's physician drive that conversation if there's a health issue that needs to be addressed. As long as there's no health issue, there are no red flags raised by the the child's pediatrician, I think having these fears may not be a very prudent way of approaching a larger body. Yeah, yeah. I mean, also always thinking about habits, like your child may be in a larger body or you are in a larger body. If you have great relationships in your life, if you have great mental health, if you are active, if you are making eating a priority and making, you know, those structured and regular times to sit down and eat, you, if you're having variety in your diet, you're doing a great job of taking care of your health. Our health isn't as 
in as much control as we are led to believe at all times. That if you are doing a lot of those those habits that are health promoting, then you're you're doing really well, and that's what I recommend focusing on because those are things that are in your control much more than the body that you're living in, the size of it, right? Yeah, that's true. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. I'll see you all next time. You've been listening to the Decoding Obesity Podcast. Please remember, the information in this podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely of the host and his guests and do not constitute medical advice. Views and opinions on this show do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of any organization. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening in. Don't forget to visit our website, www.decodingobesity.com, for show notes and more info. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on your preferred podcast listening platform. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.